Breath of the Wild. Full spoilers. The story is a reconstruction of the hero archetype, similar to how the game is a reconstruction of Zelda tropes, which focuses largely on regret and remorse. By and large, the stories of the Legend of Zelda games follow a Campbellian hero's journey, or the monomyth. It's among several legacy Nintendo properties that write after Jungian-style archetypes. This is also the reason for Miyamoto and Aonuma's historic reluctance to flip any character's sexes. A more feminine hero myth exists already in Metroid. To gloss over it, a young man gets the call to adventure. He ventures out into the unknown with a parting gift from a parental figure who may or may not die. There are friends, challenges, and temptations along the way. At the halfway point, the hero is at their lowest point. All seems lost. The hero rebuilds themselves to become more powerful. The hero atones for their previous mistake. The hero returns, bringing back with them their power and knowledge to keep their people safe. You can easily transpose these plot points onto any conventional Legend of Zelda. They're all self-admitted iterations of the same story with varying execution, intent, and style. Along with Breath of the Wild's systematic revamps, it also remixes the structure of this narrative as in media res to supply more focus onto the regret, rebuilding, and atonement segments. You wake up as Link who failed long ago, and has to walk through the remnants of a world he couldn't save, being beckoned by Princess Zelda who's effectively a suffering ghost. Where usually the young Link and the player would be introduced to a larger world through unfamiliarity, our Link has amnesia, a strong vehicle for in-media res plots using flashbacks and journal-like text dumps. These recall Link's call to adventure, the friends, temptations and challenges along the way, and ultimately the misfortune and failure. The plots of the hero's journey, particularly so conventional as The Legend of Zelda's, tell of a blind king who allows evil to reign in his kingdom. Well, there's a focus here on the refusal of the king to allow what could have prevented the devastation. His refusal to allow Princess Zelda an active role in the story, and an express focus on duty over what may be correct, inevitably led to the stagnation and fall of Hyrule. The ancient guardians and divine beasts represent the same unexamined convention and ruin which was exploited by Calamity Ganon and they are now the most fearsome of enemies in the game. This focus on fighting convention runs through the narrative and the game design of Breath of the Wild. None but a few tropes were left unquestioned, and the team rebuilt The Legend of Zelda from its NES origin as a more open-ended game into something far larger. In this way, Princess Zelda's own struggle is one of faith. She has no faith in the antiquity nor tradition, wishing to find a solution through raw reason. She never met eye to eye with her father, and her failure is a harsh contrast to his, he could not envision transformation until it was too late, and she could not accept tradition until it was too late. The only thing that seems to hold their souls to this world is their regrets. Link in these flashbacks was ultimately inactive as a supporting role, and it's not until he has died and is reborn that he fulfills his role as hero, starting once again from scratch to rebuild himself from rags into a transformed, modern iteration of his traditional archetype. This too only comes a hundred years too late. As accomplished as this storyline is, and the great idea it was to have these flashbacks be told anachronically according to player interaction, the sense of absolute freedom is sometimes overwhelming on a first playthrough. Allow me to preface the complaints I'm about to give. I care to make them constructive, and I only feel so much passion about these minor and moderate issues because I truly, truly enjoyed this game so much. The weapon deterioration is an expansion of the themes of decadence and iteration, but they only seem to exaggerate negative player psychology such as hoarding or stockpiling. As is, I don't mind the system. I don't think it's bad in and of itself. Item management is enjoyable too. But I don't think it adds to the story of the game in the way that they intended. The intent seems to be that you would treat the weapons as temporary power-ups. Maybe you could have argued that misusing your power-up would give you a feeling of regret. Then, as you learn, maybe you were meant to use these weapons in a way that doesn't breed that regret. But by giving the player more than one inventory space, they enable the rainy day mentality. This comes along with the basic combat system having a sufficient lack of mechanical depth that it makes the rainy day never come. After some experimenting to find out that the perfect dodge system is activated based on specific portions of animations, it renders all other forms of combat irrelevant. That includes the rarely used parry function which only sees advantage in long range in high level enemy combat. Whilst the parry can occasionally disarm enemies dependent on numeric values, dodging is both easier and reaps higher reward consistently. Not only that, the exaggerated feedback of perfect dodging comparatively almost implies the parry function is almost vestigial and would probably have been removed if not for the Guardian's laser attacks having no other counter. It makes coming across certain combat-oriented shrines a disappointment. Speaking of which, the shrines felt like an intrinsic reward, 
By exploring, you find control sections of gameplay and challenge. Though they're never particularly challenging either, it's always fun to think through the game's challenges, sometimes in unconventional ways. But occasionally, the game will assume the exploration was the challenge all along. The game occasionally treats shrines like they're only worth being a domain for extrinsic rewards like mid-tier weapons, materials, and clothing. This is an unfathomable amount of wasted potential. None of these complaints should really dissuade anybody from playing this game, because it's doing something nobody else really wants to do. The open world isn't bereft of content, the rewards aren't typically meaningless. In fact, a lot of my complaints can be focused down to me wanting to play more of the game. Moving on, of Link's regrets, there are the fellow champions who fell when the Divine Beasts were taken over, and their souls are held prisoner as they try to fight it from the inside. In this, it's taken from my personal favourite Zelda, Majora's Mask. The large dungeons are focused on four very well-designed maps which force you to consider your environment as if it's more than just a zone of collisions and obstacles. The boss fights demand more of the player than typical enemies, but the battle design is heavily limited by the general combat mechanics, so they're not much to talk about. Narratively, the dead champions trapped inside the beasts all hold their own subplots about things they regret that they couldn't fulfil in life. Daruna has a son that struggles to find confidence, having grown up without a father. Uroboso left behind a daughter figure who's trying to find time to be both a child and the heir to the Gerudo chiefdom. Rivali's sheer will and charisma, despite a lack of actual character, leaves a town without any true protector. This would be a regret if Rivali actually had a personality. However, these three storylines hold minor interest. They're more expressions of what make for true heroes, and what Link should become. They aren't as emotive as Zelda or the King's struggle. They don't seem to express what they wish they could have done more. They don't even add anything to Link's inferred character, other than him making amends for those already passed on, which is a plot point taken from Majora's Mask without much forethought. The one remaining Zora champion, Mifa, has an arc that hits every correct note, however. For one, the Zora live long enough that many of them remember who you are. The typical experience is Link being a nobody, which has its own sad quality, but this is the only place where Link is truly treated as an outcast. And naturally, it's the only place where his memory loss, rather than being a vehicle for the plot, becomes a plot element. There's characters who blame him for their Zora champion being killed, and they don't take kindly to him not even remembering her name. When he does recall Mifa, she clearly has a romantic fascination with him. There's some amusement and regret that her race is so long lived. She's seen him grow relatively older than her into a young man, and in all likelihood she'll outlive him for centuries. Despite that, she still wanted to pursue that romantic relationship. It's the setup to a dramatic irony where Link ended up outliving her by a hundred years. <laughs> ありがとう。でも昨日まで<笑> そしてこれからは私の力があなたの助けになれる。だからもう大丈夫。じゃあ行くね。私とルッタのお役目を果たさなきゃ。あなたがあの城で我慢と戦う時の援護。今度は失敗しないから。リンク、あの人を姫様を
They entirely missed the core themes of regret and sorrow and instead tempered the content down to fall in line with the other uninteresting champion's stories. They dropped the running theme of her wanting to spend time with Link, the cornerstone of her relationship and regret. She lost her chance to be with Link for what relatively little time she could have him, and Link couldn't save her. She had a long life ahead of her, but now she's lived a lifetime of loneliness and pain. Link's made amends and there's no bad blood, but he'll have to live with what's happened. And that is my cue to talk about this game's failings as a story. In giving Link his own name, denying the player insert, they strove toward giving him less of an implicit character. It's backed up by giving him character relations established before the player gains control, but they never fully commit to giving Link any agency bereft of player involvement. His interactions with most characters remains being a blank onlooker outside of some sassy dialogue options. He simply sits at a fire without expression. He doesn't tear up grass in vague thought. He doesn't toss and turn at night wondering what he can do. He doesn't express remorse seeing his dead friends. He doesn't turn his head aside when he's shown something that he can't correct. He doesn't even apologize to anyone. He doesn't show pride or joy unless he's cooking. He doesn't show sadness or discomfort or unless he's in extreme climates. He doesn't smile or show any reassurance unless you're taking a selfie. It'd be difficult to say that he holds any body language relevant to the story at all. And in the end, Nintendo couldn't even commit to their own themes regardless of localization errors. Link infiltrates the castle to fight Ganon, and after the first fight, Princess Zelda spells out for you that what you truly need to defeat evil is courage. You can enter the castle straight from the tutorial. You don't even need the Master Sword in this game, truly a step forward in freedom of game design. And the princess encapsulates this wonderfully in one quote, which is an instant contradiction when she gives you the Bow of Light, the only weapon capable of defeating Ganon. The only thing the hero needs is courage. And a gun. After this huge letdown of a boss fight, there's one more disappointment. Maybe viewed as a metaphor for the revitalization of the series or the revitalization of the kingdom to have its heir come back, it makes sense in the Campbellian narrative and meta narrative. Princess Zelda is alive. One of the greatest musical pieces from the Impressionist era was Pavane for a Dead Princess, and it, musically, feels like a kind of celebration backed up by a feeling of loss. And that sorrow is what leaves people thinking of it as a masterpiece. This is a game that's focused so much on what can't be taken back. The story almost delves into being a kind of high fantasy noir with the grim undertones it keeps. The game is never hidden for a second that Link is fighting for the people who are still alive to have an opportunity to live freely, which the princess even backs up herself. The most detailed side quest chain has Link fetch questing to help build a town from scratch, for example. And in every other case, this Link could not fix the past. Based on other dungeons, there's no bringing back those lost. Everything in the game has been written as though it were an optimistic tragedy, and even the game's key influences would impress towards this fact. And yet, the mechanics of which entirely unexplained, Princess Zelda is alive not having aged a day in the past hundred years, and with current retrospect it looks like it was only to supply sequel bait. Breath of the Wild is perhaps the best story and gameplay the series has seen since Majora's Mask or Wind Waker. I've no right to complain so strongly about these details, but every time I come back to playing the game I find myself ignoring everything that's so right about it, and focusing more and more on the minor faults. In a game of such high quality with a storytelling that reaches such high standards it feels exaggerated when there's these dips, especially in such key areas. In the end I felt the game could have done more in many areas that it dropped for the sake of smoother gameplay or an interest of more bluntly rewarding player accomplishment, or for financial incentives. Although. Maybe this feeling of regret is conveniently fitting.